of our Imagine uh, group today. Uh, Joe and Maria Lee are off uh, teaching a class, I'm sure, uh, that has something to do with printmaking um, in New Mexico, actually. And Sherry is in um, Colorado. Colorado. So, um, uh, so I'm going to be your facilitator for today. But so it is my pleasure to um, introduce our speaker. We don't usually have such a formal type of speaker. It's usually one of us uh, talking about our own work, but so it's really a, a joy to have Julie here. Um, Julie Swardstat Johnson um, has two, this meeting is being got it. All right, there we go. Um, is uh, kind of has two ways of being that overlap. So I'm going to first introduce her as a poet. She is a published poet. She got her MFA in poetry from Penn State. I don't know when that was, but we don't have to know that. Um, and uh, is the author, 2019 author of Pennsylvania Furnace. Uh, in 2020, she's the co-editor of Beyond Earth's Edge, the Poetry of Space Flight. And um, also in 2020, a chat book was uh, published called Orchard Light that had um, something to do with her artist in residency, I believe. Correct me, Julie, if I'm messing up. And also add, <laughs> add to this if you need to. Um, so um, uh, you also might wanna visit her website if you're interested um, and her, uh, she has um, published in, on, in many journals, and there's a list there that you can tune in to, to um, read her poetry as well. Uh, and her books are available on Amazon. So uh, she's, she's a well-published poet at this point, and I'm sure we'll continue with that in her life. All right, so her second, second big thing, I, I don't know, it might not be your second big thing. There may be stuff I don't know plenty about you that I don't know, but um, she is currently with a new title at the Poetry Center, archivist and outreach librarian. Um, she has received, and I think this is fairly recent, I don't know, her MA, so now she has two masters in library and information science from U of A. Um, and with her new, um, her new job, she is, I've got this listed here, so I don't mess up. She takes care of VOCA, which is the online audiovisual archive at the Poetry Center. It's huge and it's amazing if you can ever tune into that. Um, if you go down to the Poetry Center, someone will help you, uh, but um, you can also do that online. Uh, she manages the daily operations at the Poetry Center. She, she really has a big hat. Maybe that's why she's got her hair all pulled back today because she's, she's got a big one that she's got to wear. And um, she um, produces the podcast Poetry Centered. Um, and uh, she is also coordinates the physical and digital exhibitions at the library. So that's why one reason that we're having her, that it's so special to have her here today is because she's in charge of all those exhibits nowadays. All right, and while, while she's talking, write down any questions that come to your mind so that uh, we'll have some time to, to ask her anything that we like. Okay, did I get most of it? Yes, yeah, that was, your whole that life. Was... I know that, Julie. You're a young, vibrant woman, and um, that's just two p big pieces of your life, though. That's, yeah, that's so kind, Anita. Thank you. Um, and there we go. I wanted to make sure I'm unmuted, but yeah, thank you so much. It's really uh, a delight to come and get to talk to you all at Paperworks. Um, I really admire you as a group and and the work that you do together and as individuals. So. Um, thanks for being such a vibrant part of the, the book and art community here in Tucson. Um, and I'm, I am really looking forward to uh, the spring exhibit. It's been a long time coming uh, with all of the delays and just waiting for this to happen. So um, can't wait for that exhibit to be coming next year and to see the work that everybody produces. Um, yeah, and like Anita said, that was all perfect. Um, yeah, the, the MA part, um, my library science degree, I just finished in December. Um, of last year, which is farther away, farther in the past than I think, but uh, in the midst of the pandemic, it feels good to be done with that. Um, but so today, um, thanks again, also just for doing this on a Friday so that I can more easily join you. Um, and thanks for those of you who are gonna listen to this later in recorded format. Um, if you do have any questions, 
do feel free to email me. Um, and I think we can just make sure that my email address um, is somewhere and just feel free to get in touch with questions. But so what I'm here to do today is to tell you a little bit about our redesigned exhibit space at the Poetry Center, and then also to show you uh, four books that use language um, kind of sparsely, like the book, there's not a ton of words in them, but, and it's maybe not something where you go, wow, that's an incredible poem just on its own. Um, but the, the form of the book really takes it beyond what it might just be as, as poetry alone. Um, so I think those will hopefully inspire, um, inspire you or, or give you ideas either for things related to um, imagine or for just future work that you might want to do. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. And so are you all seeing a PowerPoint now? Great. So yeah, at the Poetry Center, if you've ever been here before, um, when you first come into the building, and even if you haven't been here, we, we've always had an exhibit space when you first enter our building. Um, they used to be a small set of cases. There was one kind of vertical case and then a long uh, row of just kind of small, maybe like a foot and a half by foot and a half little boxes. You really had to get close to them and look right down to see what was in it. Um, and people often would come in and say, where's, where's the exhibit? How do I find it? And you'd say, you're standing right next to it. Um, it was not very obvious. It had been designed um, just at a different time when we didn't quite know what we needed. Um, but so over the past couple of years, um, Sarah Kordemeyer, who, who's our library director and who has visited Paperworks in the past, um, she worked heroically to uh, get us the funding uh, together with our uh, director, Tyler Meyer. They worked really hard to get us the funding and then Sarah worked to design um, the kind of exhibit cases that would really be what they should be to show people books. They would be museum grade cases um, where it would be easy to see what was in them. The books would be in the right kind of environment all those right things would happen. So um, what you're about to see is really a testament to Sarah's hard work in making this happen. Um, but so here's just one quick, I'll show you a couple images of these cases. But so we have six new cases now in our gallery space. Um, that whole space has been redesigned. The cases that were there previously have been removed. Um, the cases that we now have, uh, we custom ordered from a, a German case making company called Caseworks. Um, and they're really, all they do is make museum grade cases and they're beautiful custom cases. Um, but so we now have uh, six cases that are each, uh, they're two by four on the base. But so overall we have probably like double or even three times as much space as we did previously. Um, in the past, like I mentioned, they were just kind of small uh, cubes or this, the case that we had was divided up into small pieces. Um, these new cases are significantly larger, and so we can show much larger format books. Um, we're also much more easily able to show broadsides now in these new cases. Uh, in this image that's in front of you, this was uh, the first part of our 60 Books for 60 Years exhibit, which if you'd like to come see these cases or just enjoy the exhibit, this is still currently up. Um, this is an exhibit that we curated uh, for last year was our 60th anniversary as the Poetry Center. Um, so over the course of about a year, uh, mainly under the direction of Sarah again, uh, we bought 60 books. Um, they were not like one for each year, it was just 60 uh, rare, um, rare books, artist books, um, just kind of beautiful things to commemorate that it was our 60th birthday. Um, but so we ended up presenting that uh, exhibit online digitally. And so now that we're open again, uh, throughout this fall, we're reprising uh, that exhibit and showing about 20 books at a time. Um, so the pictures that you'll see today are mostly of our first set of the 20, um, but right now if you come in, or first set of 60, if you come in now, you'll see kind of the second set of six, the second 20 out of 60. Um, and, and then again, in about another month, we'll change it out for the third set of 20 of the 60. But so like I mentioned, so six total cases, um, they're two by four each, so um, lots more space. They are glass on all sides, as you're kind of seeing within this image. And so the nice thing about that is you can kind of see the back side of the books. Um, in some cases, there's not necessarily anything to see, but you get a really nice sense of them as three-dimensional objects. Um, and I'm sure when, we're, when we get to the point of doing um, your exhibit in the spring, I think that's obviously going to be a really good choice for that. So let me move on to the next picture. I just have a couple pictures of these cases. Also, do feel free if you have questions as I'm talking, um, feel free to ask them or we can save them for the end. But so here's a different view of the gallery space where you're seeing these six cases lined up. 
A nice thing about these cases is that they are actually on wheels. Um, there are casters underneath that we can, you, they're not easy to move. You really have to go through a whole process of unscrewing them and moving them around. Um, but we are actually able to reconfigure how the cases are set up if we want to. Um, the way we have them set up now is probably how we'll leave them most often. Um, it's kind of the best setup within the space where people can walk all the way around um, and see things pretty well. But you might be able to see in the background through these cases, there's now a long red bench. Um, previously, there, there was just an open staircase there. Um, and in this process of redesigning this gallery space, um, we decided to add this bench kind of as a way to better delineate the space. Um, it has bookshelves on the back side, so it adds a little bit of extra um, shelving space for us. And that's been great. That was really nice to have that added in because our, our collection overall is um, over 80,000 items. We're somewhere in the 54,000 range for total number of books and we're getting new books all the time. So we're always looking for more space. Um, the cases too you're seeing in the photographs have these slanted tops um, and that's you know to give you a good view but also to keep people from, um, we sometimes have receptions in these spaces. Uh, and if you've ever been to one of those people have an interesting way of putting wine glasses on top of the cases, uh, which is not really what you want. So the, the slanted top is to keep, make it very obvious that they are there for display, not there for putting things. One more picture just to show you uh, the way these cases work, because I think you might enjoy that as, as people that think about showing books. They actually open from the side. They have pneumatic um, arms that will kind of hold the case up or make it easier to lift. Um, they're surprisingly heavy. Um, like I actually have a hard time lifting it up by myself, um, but that's just because the, the glass that around it is um, UV filtering. Um, and so the whole contraption of the case is really quite heavy. But so you put a, um, it has this handle on the side with such suction cups um, that you just add on. And then with that, if you unlock it, you can just lift it up. And then we're able to kind of really reach all the way in there and set things up. So again, it's like, it's much more space than we used to have, um, much easier to show large books, just all around a, a huge improvement for us. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview. It's a little bit hard to say much more than that, um, but do come in and see these cases if you want. Um, and, and do also just know that at the point that we display uh, this exhibit, it's gonna look beautiful. People are really gonna be able to see it. Um, people are really gonna stop and look at it. That's been one of the best things since we've reopened and had these new cases. Um, people just stop and look at the exhibits in a way that they didn't used to because it's so obvious. It's right there in front of you that there are these books on display that we want you to engage with. Um, so any, does anyone have any questions about the cases or the gallery space? I was just going to say, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask yeah. a question, they can, or else put it in chat and we can wait um, till you're done, so. Perfect, yeah, either way. Julia, okay. I'd just like to say th these are spectacular, truly yeah. spectacular in the way that they function, but in also in the way that they will show and display uh, books. Uh, oh, just wonderful, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, just huge credit to Sarah for all of her work. And um, she went all over anywhere that she could go look at cases anywhere else on campus. She went everywhere just to try to find, um, to find and, and see what was out there and make the best best choice for us. So she worked how, hard to make How long happen. did it take for them to make them? That's a good question. Um, and I'm not, it was quite a while. And part of the reason I can't remember is we were originally, we did this this summer and it was originally supposed to happen in the summer of 2020. Um, and everything got kind of slowed down just because we wasn't, we weren't really sure what was gonna happen. Um, even though we actually had already raised the money for this. But so they were made in, the, the thing I can say about the production of them is they were made in Germany um, at, by Caseworks and then shipped to us by boat and by, train and then I think they got on a, a truck before they finally got all the way here so it was quite a quite the endeavor to actually get them here um, and just a huge I mean it really took a lot of fundraising um, but I think these cases will um, because of all that effort and support this is gonna these are gonna last for such a long time um, and really do their job well. Julie what uh, you know on on the base uh -huh. it looks like there's maybe a, a linen wrapped Yes. Uh, tell, tell us about that. And, it, and I see a little dark, dark edge there. Yes. Yeah. Um, Good eyes. 
Yeah, so it is the base. It's exactly like you said, it, it is wrapped in linen. I think the color is called oatmeal. We were going for just kind of a very neutral um, white color. So underneath that, where you're seeing that dark edge, there is actually um, a space underneath for a desiccant. Um, I think it's some mm -hmm. kind of silic uh, silicate material, um, but so it's to keep the, um, when it seals, to keep it from becoming too humid inside. So they're really like nicely climate controlled. Um, I think I mentioned that it's UV glass, um, but all around it's, it's kind of everything it should be to kind of keep things exactly right. And so is the goal uh, for the Poetry Center to have a constant display of your collection and, and have rotating exhibits then? Yes, yeah, and that's a great question. I didn't think to, um, I'm forgetting if I, who's, who knows things. So I didn't think to mention our exhibit program. So yeah, we do physical exhibits all the time um, throughout every year. We've switched to a setup now where we do four exhibits in the course of a year. Um, so it's uh, January to March, April to June, July to October, uh, or July through September, October through December, um, with just like a week in between each set um, for us to change out what's in there. We do a mix of um, inviting outside artists like paperworks to put on displays. Um, and then we also will curate exhibits that showcase um, items from our own collection. Um, so things like the 60 books exhibit right now. Um, or we've done things in the past, um, trying to think of some of our most, most recent ones. We did an exhibit maybe a couple summers ago that was all collaborations. Um, so artist books or just books from the collection that were um, by one or more people or a writer with an artist. Um, but so we always are just kind of thinking like, what's the way that we can show people what we have? Our collection is so specialized um, that in some senses, the main stacks, which you were kind of seeing in the background behind the cases, those are really meant for browsing. Uh, but in terms of our, um, our artist books, our rare books, uh, those are not browsable, they're in climate controlled rooms. And so we really think about the exhibit program as a way um, to introduce people to what we do have. And either to kind of hopefully spark interest where you can come back and say, I'd like to see this um, because all of our materials in our, in our rare book room are available for anyone to request. Um, so hopefully inspiring people to come back and request materials and or if you're not somebody who would want to do that, you at least in the, through an exhibit have a chance to see something you might never otherwise see. So yeah, we definitely think of the exhibits as like an educational, um, invitational sort of thing. Julie, are, uh, this is Krista. Julie, are you going to be um, uh, talking a little bit about what's happening with the um, uh, book event uh, this coming spring? Uh, I'm just wondering if you are going to be having a special exhibit in conjunction with something that is anticipated, I think, to be in person again. And is that, um, that's a, yeah, I'm trying to make sure I'm understanding your question. Is this when you're saying a special event that's happening? TFOB. Oh, yes. Okay. I was thinking you were saying, yeah, the Festival of Books. Um, yeah, you know, so interestingly, we don't always do um, that much with TFOB, mostly just because it's such a huge event on the main part of campus. Um, in past years, we have done more, um, but I, and then we've kind of pulled back just because we saw that people didn't ever really come all the way over to the Poetry Center. So we will be having an exhibit. I mean, there will be an exhibit that's up and we will be open that Saturday, um, but I don't know that we're doing anything particular related to TFOB. I have a, this is Anne, I have a question about the exhibit space. Uh -huh. um, I've previously been in an exhibit at the Poetry Center. Um, it was one of those collaboration things and I oh. was teamed with the poet Ander um, Monsoon. Oh, okay. And um, so when you used to come in, you used to go to the left and there's like a open exhibit space mm -hmm. there. And then if you continue left, there was a wood bookcase and that was glassed that would house um, artist books. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had 2D work. So we were on the back wall uh -huh. uh, by the stacks. So is the, these cases are absolutely gorgeous, by the way. Um, so Paperworks is going to be um, 
the cases only. Is that correct? Yes. Or I mean, as far as I know, I mean, I, I think if I understand the guidelines for work that people are submitting, the idea is that it will be three-dimensional work rather than two-dimensional. Right. Um, and so in that case, we're imagining it being in the cases. Uh, there, I mean, in the future, just for other events or other exhibits, we may still use that wall space like you're thinking of down in the stacks uh -huh. um, to show things. But that bookcase, um, when you came into the left, the bookcase that didn't have any glass on it, right. that is, that ha that's been removed. Um, so oh. that's now just an open space. I'm going to have to come in and check all this out. Yeah, it's in some ways, you know, it's really different. Or I'd be curious if you do come in, what your reaction will be. In some ways, it's really different. And then in other ways, people have said it kind of looks like it's always been this way. Um, so there are changes that are very much in keeping with the building and just kind of better reflect the way we use the space. It's just such a beautiful building. I think yeah. one of my favorite spaces in Tucson is just oh. this. All right, thank you. Yeah, glad to hear that, yeah. Yeah, and do, I mean, please feel free, any of you um, watching, like here now or in the future, please do feel free to come in and just uh, see what this actually looks like in person. Um, one more question on the exhibit space. Um, I think I've been told that there may be um, some open shelving that could also hold artist books. They won't be protected by glass, but that that's also a possibility if the uh, amount of entries um, and people are willing to show without security. Yes, yeah. True? Yeah. Yeah. And I think possibly the last time that we did a paperwork show, which I think was 2015, maybe. Yes. Um, some of that same same countertop space like around the librarian's office or that downstairs glass office that's still available and then also let me go back um if you're able to see kind of behind the cases there's that bench um mm -hmm. and on top of the bench there is a very long flat counter space and we could potentially oh. show things there yeah very we sometimes yeah and p again people really stop and look at that so that's another good opportunity depending on on what there might be Yes, some people really do actually like to handle the books. So um, I don't, you know, I, I personally like to have my books out so that people can really look at them. And um, so, but both ways are great. Both ways, to have it both ways is wonderful, yeah. Yeah, it's good to, I mean, it's good to have opportunities. Yes. So one other thing just on the topic of exhibits, um, I just put in the chat a link to uh, the Poetry Center now has a uh, digital space for exhibits as well. This is something we started doing uh, in that like year plus that we were closed since we couldn't offer exhibits in person. Um, so it's a platform called Omeka, which is kind of a commonly used thing by libraries and archives to do online exhibits. Um, but so right now, if you go there, the featured exhibit, it just went up starting this week. It's called Inflection Points. Um, and it's a collaboration with um, four translators from the American Literary Translators Association. Um, and they've chosen about, I think it's 14 items, 14 or 15 items from the Poetry Center's collections um, that in some way engage with the idea of poetry and translation kind of taking new directions or, or doing new things. Um, so that's something to check out. You can also see the 60 books exhibit online as we originally presented it. Wow. Oh, that that's exciting. And also then, Julie, you're in, responsible for that online exhibit space as well. Yes. Yeah. Which yes. That's, yeah. That, and that's one, that's one of those like balancing act kind of things that while we were closed, it was the only way we could do exhibits. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that we're open again, we're kind of trying to figure out how do we use that? Uh, how do we use that with our in-person space without creating lots of work for ourselves, but while also still offering things to people who can't come in person. So We'll see. Yeah, it's a develop. It's a developing situation. <laughs> All right. Um, well, if there are more questions about um, the exhibit space, feel free to come back to me after the fact. I'm um, at the end of this, but I also do have four books to show you um, today as well. Um, Anita had uh, just suggested showing some works that um, engage with language. Like I said at the beginning, just engage with language in different ways where. Um, Maybe the quality or the length of the writing isn't the main thing, but it's really using words um, in a poetic way within it within a, a book form. So I have four to show you. So this first one, the title is As They Fall. The poet's name is Ivy Johnson, and it's from a press um, that has now, since since um, in the past couple of years, has has gone on hiatus and I don't think it's coming back, called Timeless Infinite Light. Um, but this is a book from 2013. 
And so it does not take the form of a codex. It's actually a stack of cards bound with a paper belly band, um, which you might be able to tell in the image that belly band is ripping a little bit. Uh, but this is one of these books that um, we were talking, I think before the recording started about um, not always using uh, like a font or printed text that sometimes handwriting or stamping or some other form um, is a good thing to do. So this book is one of the examples that I think aligns with that really nicely. So it's the stack of cards. And in the next image, you can see um, the, the artist, Ivy Johnson, actually the artist and writer went through and just hand wrote out these phrases or single words. Um, they were then either photographed or scanned and reproduced um, as multiple copies of this book. But she really intentionally used her own handwriting um, you can also see throughout this that it's her handwriting does not always look the same. Um, I think Anita had mentioned the idea of kind of changing the way your handwriting looks, um, and she really engages with that. So it's a pretty large stack of cards. I'm, I'm actually, now that I'm talking to you, I forget how many it is. It's, it's larger than a playing deck. Um, but each of them has anywhere from like a single word to a whole sentence or a phrase or, or something else. And the idea with this book is that you can really read it in any order. Um, you can sit down with it, you can flip cards over, you can lay them out, you can recombine them. Um, but basically, it's not trying to write a cohesive poem. It's giving you fragments of language and inviting you just to interact with them. Um, so I think I've got one more image here. So when I was reading it, I was kind of laying it out almost like I was playing a game. Um, if anybody knows the matching game set, I think that was kind of in mind for me. Um, but you could also just sit down and flip it over. You could shuffle them. You could pull one out at random and see what it says. But there's really just this sense of recombining things um, and getting this fragment, these fragments of somebody's life. So it's a really, it's a kind of a fun one just to sit down with and see what you get. I'm trying to think of the things that are on here. Um, like the one that says, I beat my fists against my chest. And then now I am hungry. So there's not really a, it's just fragments of language, fragments of a life. There's not a cohesive sense here. So that's but one if, book. Excuse me. But yeah, if you put it together and you can deal the cards out in very many different ways, you can make uh, poems. Exactly. Uh, in all kinds of different arrangements by just reading the lines and the phrases in a different um, order. It's right. exciting actually to read it that way. I've been doing that while we've been watching. Yeah, no, and it, I think it would be a fun one if you imagine sitting down with multiple people, you could deal cards around and read it as a group. Um, you could rearrange it into a poem. So there's really a sense, she really moves away from, here I'm handing you a book and I'm expecting you to move through it page by page and says, here are these pieces, do with them what you want. Have you, uh, uh, Julie, have you reflected on uh, the dilemma we have with um, the generation that is coming up and not being able to read script writing? Yeah, I mean, a little bit, but I also think so. Just to reflect on having like a, I have a 10 year old uh, niece, a nephew. Um, and he's actually learning cursive in school. So I think there is an interesting, uh, as much as there kind of was an era of people that did not really learn ha much handwriting in school, I think it's also coming back for some people. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I don't have too much to say on that, although that is a really interesting question of like what happens for people that didn't learn to write in cursive or are not really familiar with that. What, do you have any reflections on that? Because that is an interesting question. Yeah, I, I only what I, you know, only what I read, which is, you know, that there is a, a gap, certainly. And, um, uh, you know, the idea that English is still the, you know, a dominant language, just because I guess, um, you know, nobody's willing to go into kanji and learn Chinese. <laughs> um, you know, it's, a, it's an easy language for the world to have as a base language. But um, the, you know, the, the, the idea, I think you're right. I think, it's, I think it might be coming back. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I just wondered if that, was, if that was part of the reflection that you, you, you all were doing. 
Yeah. And, and maybe that's an interesting place for a book to think about, uh, you know, script styles and how um, different people might interact with handwriting. So I'm some, I'm really interested, or a lot of my writing as a poet has been um, reading documents in archives. So older things that are just a different era of um, handwriting, like from the 19th century. And I know sometimes when I sit down with things that even having spent time with those kind of documents, your eyes can glaze over a little bit of like, what is, what is this? I have to really focus on reading each word. So maybe there's material for a book there, but thank you for the question. Um, so the next book I've got for you is titled 100 Colorado Places. It's by two writers and artists, Eric Anderson and Elizabeth Robinson, also from a similar era as the last book, so 2012. And so this book, you pull it out, it's kind of small, um, about you know palm-sized. Initially, it looks like a pretty normal uh, codex style book, um, other than the, you know, the top edge of it obviously has something going on. But so once you open this book up, um, it is not even remotely a typical codex. It's many long strips of paper that are um, bound together in the middle. They are folded to have pages that kind of fit together but the top of it is cut to look like mountain ranges of varying sizes. And each of the pages, each side has just a single name on it. And so as the title of the book implies, it is literally 100 Colorado place names. They're actual places in the state of Colorado. Um, in the picture on the screen, you can see Never Sink Trail, No Name Creek. On the other side, Quandry, Sunbeam, Gun Barrel. Um, but so this is a book that's taking the, the two writers selected these names, they didn't create them, um, they selected from existing things, and then assembled them into this object. Um, I think you could call this a list poem, you've taken, uh, taken 100 names and just listed them, um, and in a sense arranged them, they are actually printed in a certain order. But this is another one where the reader is really kind of left to work through it on their own. There's not a single way to read this book. You can kind of move the pieces around, set it up differently on the table, flip through it in different ways, um, and experiencing experience these 100 words in a different way. Um, but so the form of the book is really facilitating that reading experience. It's also facilitating a sense of a landscape of places. Um, but I think also that there's a sense of mystery I have no idea where Quandry, Colorado is. Is it a town? Is it a ghost town? Is it a trail? Is it a peak? Um, there's a sense of, there's some openness there. Like there might be some that you recognize and say, I know where that is. Um, but there's also some curiosity that they create by just giving you the name with no other details. Um, so this is one where, again, it's like they really have not created, they haven't created any of this language, but they have uh, artfully arranged it and presented it for the reader to experience. So this is a favorite to show. The third book that I have for you is a brand new one. Um, this is one that um, Sarah bought really recently titled Lunar Volvel. Uh, the artist is Monica Ong. And I think it was maybe like five years ago, she did a, an, a, an exhibit series here in Tucson um, called Silent Anatomies. Um, and you might have seen that around somewhere, but she's this brilliant uh, poet, book artist, um, just kind of thinker about poetry. And she has started a press called, titled Proxima Vera. Um, and mostly she's published um, her own things at this point, but I think she's really interested in publishing work that is um, kind of unusual forms. Uh, and you'll see that from her book that this kind of gives you a sense of what this press is doing. But so it is, uh, this is this is the book. It is a, uh, a volvel, which I had to look up what that is. It's basically what we're looking at where you have a chart. There's often a series of um, circles on top that move. And it's something that originally kind of comes out of the medieval period um, and was a way for people to make um, kind of like mathematical calculations of when things would recur. So the interesting thing about this book is that it, uh, it is actually set up so that if you turn all of these circles that you're seeing are individual dials. And so if you turn around, um, there are instructions on the next sheet. But you can turn these two little pieces to the actual day of the month, and then you set it to the phase of the moon. Um, and this disc that's in the center where you're now seeing a face will actually show you the correct phase of the moon. 
So this first one, I think we set up yesterday before I took this picture. And yesterday it was a new moon, that little tiny sliver you're seeing in the middle. Um, as you move these different, uh, the different little dials around, um, you get a different sense of the words that are also then written around the circles, um, the circles of the, uh, the Volvel. And um, it's not a very long poem again, it's probably something like 30 words. But as you get to sit with it and turn the pieces around, um, you experience it in a different way. So if you are having a chance as I'm talking to read the little description that's next to it now in this image, um, at the end, she says, fear not, during the full moon, my, mother, my father's mother will watch over you. And so that little face that you're seeing in the, in the middle is a photograph um, of her uh, paternal grandmother. Um, and the, the poem has, has to do with her family and with those family experiences. So there are layers of like using this actual form of the Volvel, um, this historical form, but then kind of inserting poetry into it. And again, this is another example of a book where um, the reader is really invited to create it as they're going. It doesn't really have a static form. And this one, again, I just invite you to come, come in and ask to see this book because uh, I'm realizing as I'm showing it to you that it's actually so much more exciting to sit with it and move the dials around than it is for me to just tell you about it. What size is it? It is, I wanna say it's like 10 by 10. It might even be more like eight by eight. It's not large, um, but it's not tiny either. It's kind of comfortable. So one last book to show you, and this is another new acquisition for us. Um, the title is What the South Wind Says, and it's a uh, collaboration between the poet Diane Gage and a book artist, Bhavna Mehta. It's from 2015, and it is a, it's a box set of six books. And I think I'm correct in saying that it's a unique edition, so there's only one. Um, or if there's more than one, each one is, is slightly different, or it's I think at most there might be five sets, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's unique that we just have the one. Um, so Diane Gage, the poet, wrote a series of about six poems um, that are quite short. They're only about six lines each. Um, but with the artist, um, Bhavna Mehta, they went through and really turned them into these very intricate um, cut out, uh, like, so like you're seeing on this cover of the box, um, it's just cut by hand with an X-Acto knife, these beautiful um, cut out pieces throughout. So it's six individual little volumes inside, but so they all kind of mimic what you just saw on the cover. Um, there's multiple colors of paper. Uh, the poetry has been cut into the pages. There are interesting folds. And then there's also hand stitching. Um, so on this one, you're seeing the word twirling, um, but there's more of that throughout where they really just carefully gone through a thread. So this is just everyday materials. It's just colored paper, X-Acto knives, um, embroidery thread. It's nothing really special. And the poems themselves, I, I think, like I said, they're very short, they're not all that involved, um, but they become this really engaging experience through the materials. I think I've got one more. These are uh, photographs that Sarah took and used for a blog post. Um, but so this is another one where, um, with the way the picture is taken, you're not seeing the words, but it's really the, the form of the book, the way the paper, there are you know, multiple layers of paper that, that are popping off of each other. They're really intricately cut. Um, so it's really this whole visual experience more than just the words themselves. All right, um, so that's, those are the four books. I can go back to any of those images if you want. And I will also put in the chat a link to uh, Proxima Vera, which is the press that made the Lunar Volvel, in case you're curious. And then also I will drop in a link to uh, what the Southwind says. Um, if you go to that website, you can see even more images of that. But with all of those books, if you'd like to come see any of those, you're welcome to come into the library and just ask for them, um, and we can bring those out. So any questions about those books or enthusiasms or reactions or any, anything at all? Um, Julie, I have a question about your protocol now um, yeah. regarding handling books. That is, um, I know that there's some discussion about whether or not um, wearing gloves is necessarily a good idea or how, how are you working that now? 
Yeah. So we typically don't ask people to wear gloves um, just because in, in the vast majority of cases, the kind of books that we have, um, if you're wearing like the kind of like white cotton gloves or really any gloves, you're actually more likely to tear the paper of a book um, just because you've lost that tactile sensation. So probably if you came in to see any of the books that I just showed you, um, we'd probably ask you to wash your hands um, and then just to handle them that way. So just making sure your hands are really clean rather than wearing gloves. Um, the couple exceptions to that that I can think of in our collection, we do have one book. Uh, it was our 50,000th, 50, 50, which is hard to say, 50,000th 50, book that we purchased. Um, and it's a beautiful artist book of a, a poem by W.S. Murrow entitled Trees. And that one is made out of um, white uh, foam core parts of it. But so it's something that marks really easily. And so with a book like that, um, that's a book that we mostly will sit down with people and actually show it to you rather than just kind of letting you handle it. Um, but when I'm handling that book, I wear white gloves just because it, the, the actual material marks. So, you know, you look at it and you feel like you got a mark on it. Um, but that's a really rare case. Most of our books, we're just gonna ask you to handle it gently with clean hands. But great question. Uh, I have another question um, since nobody's leaping in. Um, could you go back to inflection points, Omega? Yeah. And um, it looked like, I couldn't tell what kind of paper that was on. And when you said inflection points, oh, um, inflection points is the online exhibit that's up right now. Oh, no, that's not it then. Uh, maybe it was the Colorado. Yes, yeah, that one. And that one I think is on Arches paper, but let's see, let me share my screen. Yeah, so 100, is this the one you're thinking of? I think that's the one. Yeah, and so it is. Um, if you're looking underneath their names, you can kind of see the watermark for arches. Um, and it is just like a heavy, that kind of heavy off-white paper. Okay. Yeah, and it is, I don't know that you can see in this next image, but I think there are places where you can see the seams. Um, I think some of it is just really long strips, but there are a couple of places where I think it was glued together to make it that full length. And, and do, does, yeah. um, do books that are that are in your um, various um, uh, contests or whatever you call them um, uh, or available for purchase, do they have to be on archival materials? Yeah, so books like that we're con that we would consider purchasing or, or um, specifically for this for the paperworks exhibit. Well, either either way, for the paperworks exhibit, um, and you were, you know, if 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 things are not for sale, mm -hmm. which I presume is one of the options that we have, could could something be submitted that would be, um, you know, non archival? Yeah, and so I think that's kind of a, a choice that you as a bookmaker get to make. Um, so we do have books in our collection. Um, I'm thinking of one that was made, it's, an, it's a unique edition, so there's only one, um, but it was made by an art student at the U of A and it's inside of a paint can. Um, and so the paint can, I, I think is arguably not an archival material and I'm not sure the paper inside of it is either. Um, but we also have some books that are made out of um, recycled materials, like recycled um, kind of like cardstock boxes. Um, I think one is made out of like a, a case from beer cans. Um, so we, so you as an artist, I think could decide to say, I'm not gonna use archival materials because um, that's not part of what this, you know, that the, the non-archival materials is, is part of what this book is trying to say, or it's part of what the form of it is taking. Um, if that makes sense, that sentence kind of didn't go where I meant it to go, but saying that like the material that you use that's not archival is part of what the book is trying to say, that it's not gonna last forever, basically. How, how many artist books do you have in the Poetry Center collection? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to other than to say that in our rare book room, which is that collection that would contain the artist books, um, that that room has about 3,000 books. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to guess that the artist book portion of that is maybe like a, a quarter of it, though it might be less or more. Um, but so I'd say we probably have somewhere in the range of 
a thousand artist books, although now that I'm saying that out loud, that might not be enough. That might be more than that. Um, but in general, in the rare book room, it's about 3000 volumes. And when people request to see a book from the rare books room, <clears throat> um, the book is brought out and there's a, I'm, I'm relying on my memory here. Yeah. But there's a place to look at it, but um, it, uh, uh, somebody from the Poetry Center will produce the books and look at it while you're sitting there. Yes, yeah, and anytime that we're open, um, <clears throat> you can either come to the front desk or to the downstairs office um, and, and just say, I'd like to see this book um, and we will, we will get it for you. For rare books and for um, some of our, we have, a, a ser we have photographs and some other things that are really unique. Um, and so for those kinds of things, we do ask you to fill out a form just agreeing to handle it well, uh, basically. Um, but so once, once you've done that, um, then we just bring out whatever you want to see. And we're very happy to do that. Uh, people, people could ask to see many more books than we, uh, you couldn't ask for too many books, I think is what I'm trying to say. We're always delighted to show people rare books. And do you have an online catalog of your rare books or how does that work? Yeah, we do. So two options. Um, there is, we just have a catalog for our, our collection as a whole um, and things that are in the rare book room will show up there. Let me pull up and I can drop it into the chat. We do specifically have um, a list just of our rare books and I'll put the link here. It's a PDF, um, so it's not necessarily the a searchable thing other than like you can do like command uh, or control F to find something that you want. Um, here we go. But it's a, a PDF that we update annually that just lists everything that's in the rare book room. So that's a way to kind of browse uh, without actually seeing the book. So, and you could also come in if you don't know a specific thing you want to see, you could just come in and say, I'd like to see um, I'm, you could say I'm someone with paperwork, so you don't even have to say that. You could just say, I'd like to see some artist books. Um, here are some things I'm interested in. And whoever you're talking to would be uh, delighted to have a conversation with you and say, how about, how about these three? I'll be right back um, and give you some things to see. So we're happy to do that as well. And what a wonderful opportunity that is. Wow. Yeah. yeah, for us, for us too. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was fun for me today to kind of think about like, what could I show you that would fit with this topic? So um, so yeah, we love this question. You have to be tremendously familiar with the collection um, and, and as the archivist now with, because all of that is under your uh, direction. Yeah. Yeah. I've been fortunate enough to be here. I've been here for um, going on seven, seven years now. And so I've seen a lot of the collection over time, um, but it's also, uh, I'm always amazed by how much I've never seen or that I find for the first time sometimes. So it's, it's a huge collection. There's always new, new depths to explore. And I know you also have first editions of uh, poets who are no longer with us, which is always uh, interesting, I think, for people to see, be able to see things like that. In, in, uh, uh, because it is, that is rare. That yes, is yeah. truly rare uh -huh. and precious and precious. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if anyone, I kind of dove right into talking about the exhibit space in these books, but if anyone is, is looking for just like a more basic introduction to the Poetry Center, um, do check out our, our website it has kind of an overview. Um, or if you just visit, if you say, um, I'd like a quick tour or kind of an overview of who you are and what you do. Um, one of us working in the library is always happy to do that. So um, that's available. Um, hey, Julie, um, what about um, uh, when we're talking about works in translation, for example, mm -hmm. Um, what do you have in the way of um, books from um, some of the languages that are languishing? Um, and I'm specifically thinking about the, the local uh, Yaki and uh, Atam um, poets who are struggling to keep their languages alive. Yeah, so we do, um, uh, Donna Autumn specifically, we do have, um, there are a couple of anthologies that are kind of recent from the University of Arizona Press, and then also um, Ophelia Zapata, um, if that's a, a name you know, we have work by her um, that is bilingual. Um, but we do try to collect um, 
local poets and local indigenous poets, especially, um, we do have work by those people and that is something we're always interested in. So um, they're not kind of kept together in a specific section, um, but that's another thing where you could always uh, write to us or come in and say, I'm really interested in this. What do you have that aligns with this? And we could kind of give you a list of some ideas. And is Ophelia our new poet laureate? I'm trying to think. I think there's somebody who is either an who is who is recognized as a you know I, I, amongst the poetry community, and yeah. she's an American. Who I don't that? know if she is. Um, I know possibly um, another person is uh, Natalie Diaz. Recently, won. Um, I think she won the Pulitzer Prize, but maybe it was another one of those huge ones. She's not from Tucson, but she is an indigenous writer um, of Arizona who um, works extensively on the Mojave language um, and kind of more so, she doesn't necessarily write in Mojave, but she's very involved in um, efforts to keep that language alive in that community. Thanks. But yeah, so many wonderful indigenous poets in Arizona. I was wondering, um, you know, is there any, any overlap in collections between the Poetry Center and special collections? Yeah, and that's a great question. There is. Um, we are totally separate from them. Um, we kind of interact with the main library, but we're not part of the main library. Um, so we don't, we don't coordinate our collecting with them at all. Um, so sometimes we will both have something. Special Collections does have a, a really amazing uh, assortment of artist books. And they're a great place in this to, to look at artist books in the sense that they're not, we, we only try to buy things if we're pretty sure we would describe them as poetry. Special Collections has a much broader sense of what they will collect as artist books. Um, with Special Collections, I think it's a couple of years ago now, they did have an exhibit that was exclusively artist books. Um, and I think there is also an online version of that. Um, so if you kind of Google Special Collections um, and look for their exhibits, um, I think you'll find that, but also just going in person, I think, um, I'm pretty sure right now they're appointment only, but I think you could write to them and say, I'd like to see some artist books and check that out. It's nice to be on a campus where there's so much good collecting going on, um, like between special collections and um, just all the things happening in the School of Art. There's a lot of, a lot of good work. That's it's a fantastic resource for the yeah. entire community. Yeah. Any other questions? And also, let me just put my email into the chat. Um, feel free to write to me with a question. Feel free to call the Poetry Center. Come on in. Come enjoy books. You don't even have to have a question. Just come and see what we have. Um, we, would, we would be delighted to see you. Thank you. So Julie, I just want to thank you so much. Um, this was a lot of information on in many different directions. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> really important information that you've given us today. And uh, I think will help help our members to kind of gauge um, what to expect. Um, but also just to get in there, members go into the Poetry Center. <clears throat> it's safe. Julie said it's relatively safe. We can go not in a big group. But um, as individuals or a small group of you, if you want to um, go together, would I'm sure be all right as well. Yeah. So I can't thank you enough. You, you're a wonderful presenter and very yeah. clear. Um, the four books were wonderful, especially in their diversity and showing different ways to use text that um, artists have used text and that we don't have to have poems here, you all, for this exhibit. They can be uh, phrases that are poetically art or uh, woven in or artfully um, presented in your work. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. Yeah, thank you all so much for the time. Here. Yes. All right. Good. And um, let's see. So we will, yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you for all the nice comments in the chat, too. <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, we will be meeting in November, and um, I will send out a notice for that meeting. Uh, any anything else from anybody today? Thank One you, and that's for all you do. Yeah. <laughs> One last question, and that is, if we come down to the Poetry Center um, Monday through Friday, um, 
what, what's the parking situation? That's a really good question. Yeah. And just also to say, so it's Tuesday through Friday, uh, nine to five and then Saturday, nine to three. Um, unfortunately, if you, if you come on one of those Tuesday to Friday days, um, parking at the university is not the most delightful thing. Um, it is always paid parking. Uh, there's either a parking garage, Highland garage is the closest to the poetry center. And that's $2 an hour. Um, or there is also just down the block from us on Helen, um, there are also some meters there that are a little bit cheaper. Um, so other options are um, if you're anywhere nearby, like biking, walking, take the streetcar, take, take the bus. I can, I take the bus to work. So I'm always happy to tell people about the bus. Um, but so on, you know, during the week, unless you um, don't mind paying for parking, look for those alter alternative methods. Um, if you come on a Saturday when we're open nine to three, parking is completely free and you can park anywhere. Um, if there's a football game, it's a little bit trickier, but other days it's very easy. And what about the, what about the spaces that are right behind the Poetry Center per se? There are half a dozen spaces there, are there not? Yeah, and so those are, again, they're university controlled. Um, so all of the street parking during the week, um, it's all permitted parking. Um, and they've gotten to be pretty aggressive about enforcing that um, in my experience. So um, you can always risk it, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Julie, um, you know, a lot of places are going digital and you use your phones to pay for parking. Do you know yeah. if the parking garages are still like cash and it, a person taking? Yeah, thank you for asking that. It is not at the U of A anymore. Um, and Highland, so if you park, um, all of the garages at U, U of A are now um, pay by app. Um, okay. It's an app called Passport. Um, which once you have the app, it's pretty easy, but the first time you use it, it can be kind of annoying. Um, if you don't want to pay with an app, it is possible to park at the, it's the second street garage. It's the one right by the student union. Um, that one still has pay by cash options. And I think actually has a cashier or has like a station. Um, but as of right now, Highland is only paid by app. There's rumors that there might be a kiosk coming and we're really rooting for that, um, but it's not, not happened yet. Good. And also if you're ever annoyed about parking at the university, please feel free to call parking and transportation and tell them. Um, we've been telling people <laughs> that of like, maybe if everybody complains, they'll, they'll make it easier. So yeah, but Saturdays, very easy. Oh, Saturdays. Yeah. Easy, no problem. Yeah. Yes, or streetcar, or the bus, or your bike. <laughs> or carpool, a group yes. figure it out together. Yeah, that's right. a good option too. <laughs> okay, All right. well, thank you. And uh, Anita, do you have anything else to say? Are we going to meet again next week or? No, no. I mean, next we, month? Next month, and I will send out a notice for next month. Uh, for November. So you all, um, this will be an open meeting, bring books, bring questions, bring um, problems that you're having, and uh, we'll discuss things. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. So really do that. Or if you finished a book, oh, we would love to see that too. It's all that's always exciting to see a finished book. We've had some great presentations over these last few months. And we'll probably start winding this down unless somebody else wants to um, take it over, the, our, the Zoom meeting's over. But for sure next month, bring work, bring questions, bring problems, bring thoughts, bring your creativity, bring yourselves to it. Sounds good. So I'm gonna end the meeting and thank you all for coming. And thank you so much, Julie. Uh, we you. really appreciated it. And I have recorded this meeting, so I will um, get this up on our webpage uh shortly our youtube channel and also um if anybody wants to save the chat um you can just go down to the chat box yourself and there's a three little dots there if you push that you can save chat yourself to your own computer okay hmm. so um okay well i'm going to end the meeting now thank, thank you so you much <laughs> thanks bye 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 now